Chapter 1331 The Dongshin Sutra's Tenth Gene Lock The chef finally made a move, but it wasn't in the way Three-Eye Emperor predicted. Rather, she moved her empty left hand. The hand burst into a limb of bright fire. Swiftly, she looked as if she attempted to grab hold of Three-Eye Emperor's head. Pa, you think you can catch me with that miserable speed? Three-Eye Emperor, who had managed to avoid her reach, spoke to her with great disdain. Still, the chef looked incredibly powerful, and it was just her speed, in Three-Eye Emperor's special vision, where she looked very slow. Three-Eye Emperor readied himself to dodge a potential repeated try, but he suddenly felt as if he couldn't move. He was shocked, and in great wonder why this was, he looked down. And that's when he saw it. A giant fork had pierced through his entire body. He had been skewered with a dinner utensil at complete unawares. Three-Eye Emperor had no clue when the fork had appeared. But he knew he hadn't the time to mull this over, for he was as helpless as a chicken wing propped on a skewer above a barbecue flame. And then he realized she hadn't attempted to grab his head, at all. She had just moved to grab the fork, and he had misinterpreted her move. This had been a costly mistake. She grabbed the handle of the large fork, the prongs of which had firmly pierced through Three-Eye Emperor's meaty body, and summoned a fire to envelop it. The flames themselves looked particularly hungry as they began to creep upon Three-Eye Emperor's clothing and ravage the spirit. The flames settled on his flesh and began to sizzle and sear his body. He began to give off a wonderful aroma that tantalized the senses of the nose and got one's mouth drooling. Arg! Three-Eye Emperor began to writhe on the prongs of the fork in pain. It was agony, feeling himself get roasted alive in open flames. No matter how much he squirmed, he could not free himself. The best he could do was flail with his spear in hand trying to strike the devilish chef. Then, the sound of a hungry dragon groaning was heard. Before he could respond and see where it might be coming from, his head was immediately assaulted with an ice cream scoop. Dragon Lady Chef scooped his third eye right out of its socket. The chef performed the action with sickening calmness. She was gentle and unconcerned, and she treated three two-eye emperor as if he was an ordinary slab of meat she had to prepare for dinner. One hand held the large fork, and the other held the utensil of choice. More often than not, the cleaver. Getting him to a nice golden color, Dragon Lady Chef then began the carving process. She peeled his skin and his flesh off with perfect precision, regardless of how much the roasted emperor tried wriggling around. This disgusting spectacle had drawn the attention of quite a few by now, and it made everyone ill. It was horrendous to see, and yet Dragon Lady Chef did not even blink once throughout the entire process. For some gut-wrenching reason, this seemed ordinary for her. Xie Qin King watched her perform and then thought about the food she had frequently produced for him. When he tried to imagine the well-being of the ingredients she had used in past meals, he wanted to hurl. Tuai Emperor wanted nothing more than to die. The pain was excruciating, and he couldn't stand it a single second longer. All he could do was writhe around, drowning in the agony and tears. But the chef continued doing her thing lopping and slicing all the perfectly cooked meat she could. She didn't seem likely to stop until there was nothing left but his bones. His cries rang loud across the expanse, growing in volume. Eventually, he could be heard echoing down the valleys for miles around. Spirits could respawn, yes, but it wasn't as if they forgot how their deaths came about. It would come as no surprise if they were to learn Tuai Emperor never recovered from this ordeal, and he'd be scarred forevermore. This was not something someone could ever forget. Hansen, while this was ongoing, was still focused on the fight with no god emperor and ruin emperor. He wasn't doing as well as he had imagined. No god emperor hit him over and over, drawing more and more blood each time. It was like he was accepting a lashing. Ruin emperor beat him until he was black and blue, seemingly enjoying every single punch he could deliver. Hansen was up against the two strongest emperors in the third god sanctuary. While he was perfectly capable with dealing with them, he had submitted to accepting all the pain they could deliver. Jade's skin was strong, but it was not indestructible. Gritting his teeth to withstand the beating, Hansen did not let the pain affect his mind. He hissed, Yeah, that's right. Beat me. Beat me like you beat your fat wife. Hansen wanted this because of the tantalizing feelings he received as he was being hurt. Most attacks never made him feel this way. But through the pounding given by those two strong emperors, he felt remarkable. He had to feel like he was going to be torn in two, and it took the sort of pain no god emperor and ruin emperor could inflict to make him feel this way. With ten gene locks of jade skin, 
not even an emperor could kill him, despite the free pummeling he was offering them. It was rare to receive such strong attacks repeatedly and remain alive and well. No god emperor and ruin emperor were able to cycle through a variety of different methods to make Hansen feel the pain he wanted to feel, and they focused on what hurt the most. And while this was good for them, they didn't know this was what Hansen wanted. Onlookers believed he was getting wrecked and destroyed by the two emperors, but little did they know Hansen wanted it this rough. He was cherishing every second of the pain. Hansen's dog Shin Aura had maxed out, but he still hadn't been able to open his 10th gene lock. But on this day, while receiving the pain they inflicted, he felt his cells become invigorated. There was activity and excitement in his body he had not felt for a long time. He thought his cells were as small as they could be already, but after the 10th gene lock finally broke, they became even smaller. And those shattered cells looked incredibly special, beneath the light of the Dong Shin Aura. Hansen felt as if the entire world was different now. With Dong Shin Aura this way, the entire world seemed foreign and fantastic. It felt new. Hansen saw everything in a completely different light. He could observe the smallest detail of the smallest thing in the environment. He could study blades of grass at a molecular level. This vision he now had was almost scary. Nothing escaped his attention anymore, and he himself knew no details would go unnoticed. Hansen made a comparison in his mind likening it to the sight of a beautiful woman going at it with another man. Other men would only see the shape of a beautiful woman, but he could not only see every pore and imperfection on her skin, but the bacteria that existed on her. With Dongshen Aura like this, the entire world looked primitive. I can see through everything? Is that what the true meaning of the Dongshen Sutra seeks to imply? Hansen felt as if he had broken through something most remarkable, and while it was brilliant, it made him feel as if he wasn't human anymore. Ruin Emperor and No God Emperor's attacks now looked extremely strange to Han Senator. Their bodies were no longer solid. Their movements came with a flurry of colored dots around them, which Hansen had trouble understanding right now. He believed them to be representations of power, or maybe even the smell of the emperors. In Hansen's vision, it soon became clear they had also been built this way too. He could see right through them as if they were just vectors and wireframe polygons. If I break the structure of these beings, what would happen? Hansen thought to himself as he looked on them. Chapter 1332, Super Spank Hansen reached out to no god emperor, who was now little more than binary code given physical form and shape. He reached out and tried to break him. With the 10th gene lock of the Dong Shin Sutra open, everything felt different. The coursing of power in and around him felt tangible, and it all provided him a strange, yet wondrous sensation. In Dong Shen Aura, his own body became a sequential structure of sorts. This was what he saw himself as, all except for his hands. Before his hands came into contact with No God Emperor, the spirit's No God Sword was bearing down on Hansen's head. Hansen brought his hand up as a barrier to brace against the sword. No God Sword also looked like a sequential structure to his eyes now, but one that was different than his own. Everything around had a sequence structure, but everything was individual and unique. The sequences all ran separate to one another, but when seen all together, they seemed to run in perfect harmony. When Hansen's fingers unfurled and closed back down on the No God Sword, his hand was able to break one of the sequences. The process, to Hansen's newfound vision, was like the tipping of a domino. And when that first sequence broke, the others quickly followed. Others saw things the same as always but what they saw still wowed them and had them look on at something most incredible. In Hansen's hand, they saw the No God Sword crumble to dust and scatter to the wind. Everyone around, No God Emperor and Ruin Emperor included, looked at what had occurred in audible shock. Each and every one gasped, not thinking such a thing was possible. They thought Hansen was going to die soon, submitting to their constant pummeling. Yet despite all that, they saw a man who had nearly been broken rise up from the ashes like a phoenix. They watched him grab his aggressor's sword and break it. And of course, no god sword was not just any ordinary sword. Chills ran down all their spines. Hansen could hardly believe it, either. He was still bewildered by the rush of how things had changed, following the opening of the 10th gene lock. It was nearly scary. What was going on? Now I know how Dong Shin Zi was able to break through the vacuum, Hansen said to himself, as his own mouth gasped at the realization. Ruin Emperor then followed up, swinging his fist towards Hans Senator Hansen grabbed his fist and broke the sequence he could see, 
which nearly obliterated his entire body. Cracks in his very form had quickly webbed their way across him. Then, as if the action had been effortless, the cracks widened and collapsed. Ruin Emperor crumbled into dust, just as the sword had. Silence. Total silence. Everyone was silent following that, struggling to comprehend the fact that the all-supreme Ruin Emperor had been killed through one punch. And that punch had been so powerful, the spirit had crumbled into little more than ash. It was all over. The spirits now knew there was no hope for them to remain there, and so they all began to flee. They scarpered back to wherever they came from. When Ruin Emperor died, Hansen and his companions got their original powers back, too. No God Emperor looked at Hansen with a face drained of all color. He too wished to flee, as he had once done before. No God Emperor tried teleporting away, but Hansen was quicker on the draw. He used Ghost Slash. Impossible. No God Emperor himself then suffered the same fate, turning to dust as his sword and Ruin Emperor had. Hansen's companions did not spring into action, as might be expected, upon the return of their abilities. Instead, they each just remained still, like statues. They looked at Hansen as if he was a monster, not their strong and righteous leader as he long had been. And eventually, their eyes turned to Hansen's hands. To them, they were magic hands. With all the spirits running off, it was expected of them to chase after the spirits they could. But so grand and baffling was Hansen's deed, they forgot to go after them. It had slipped Moment Queen's mind entirely. What in the sanctuaries was that power? Flower Empress asked East Empress. Ruin Emperor and No God Emperor were the strongest spirits in the sanctuary, and despite facing them both simultaneously, Hansen had managed to one hit kill the both of them. Honestly? I don't know. For the first time in a long time, I don't know. East Empress actually looked frightened as she spoke, and her lips trembled to utter her response. Heavenly Empress then found herself having to ask the obvious question. Can any spirit beat him? Is there anyone left we can call upon? Yes, there is. The king. Flower Empress quickly proclaimed, convinced the spirit of her sleepless nights was just out there somewhere. She did her best to convince herself he was their last hope, and one day he would re-emerge, ready to defeat Han Sr. I hope you're right about that. If you're not, and there truly is no other, spirits of the third god's sanctuary are in danger. We could very well face extinction, Heavenly Empress said, half entertaining Flower Empress' strained belief. The news of Hansen being able to one-hit kill Ruin Emperor and no God Emperor in a duel against them both was heard throughout the Third God Sanctuary. No one knew what the power Hansen had employed was, so others came up with a name for it instead. Super Spank. Spirits called it Super Spank, for he had slapped no God Emperor and Ruin Emperor to death. Many spirits were worried now, for they knew there was no competing against Hans Senator if he came for their territories, there'd be no hope of resisting. And when the news reached the Alliance, no one believed it. A few hundred spirits and creatures had amassed to attack Hansen's shelter, and having laid waste to such numbers, Hansen had also then gone on to kill No God Emperor. Humans did not know about Ruin Emperor, but they did know about No God Emperor through Divinity's bout. They knew how terrifying he was, and the thought of Hansen felling him with ease seemed like a stretch. While people were quick to disregard the news at first, it soon became clear it was no lie. And what's more, the news was heard through the chattering of spirits, and there'd be no reason for spirits to lie about this. If anything, repeating the story was doing them a disservice. No God Emperor Super Spank to death. Good, bad, he's the guy with the Super Spank. The one Emperor to rule them all. Hansen did not return to the Alliance yet though. First, he wanted to conquer the entirety of the Third God Sanctuary. After Night Empress aided Hansen and Lotus Empress by killing numerous emperors, and after the events that had just transpired at Moving Star Shelter, the Third God Sanctuary was now at its most vulnerable. Hansen was unstoppable, and the remaining spirits knew this. None would dare get in his way, and so they all obeyed Hansen and provided him with their spirit stones when he started making rounds. Before what had just occurred, they would never obey a human, but Hansen was too intimidating. And to them, he wasn't just a mere human like the rest were. He had a unique reputation of terror. Areas that had not been controlled by Hansen yet discussed how they might fight back and revolt. But they all secretly knew it would be futile. Hansen took a break after a while and went to the spirit base as a super king spirit. It had been a while since he last played the part of the king. 
Chapter 1333 Free Spirit Geno Points Inside the Ninth Spirit Base, a few spirits were discussing amongst themselves. Six Arm, did you hear about the human and his super spank? What a silly question. Of course I have. It destroyed both Ruin Emperor and No God Emperor. The human has been expanding the reach of his territory following that, hasn't he? I wonder what powers he practiced to be able to do what he did. I have heard some spirits have tried to resist him and have refused to pledge their allegiance to the man when he came to their shelters. Needless to say, they were quickly struck down. He's merciless. If it goes on like this, he'll soon end up claiming the entirety of the third god's sanctuary. You worry far too much, far too soon. It won't be as easy for him as he thinks. He is a human, and those who accompany him are spirits and creatures. He treats them well, but when he claims a shelter, the spirit that previously owned the place is put under a contract with one of his close allies. There is no such thing as an invincible foe, powers have a limit. There must be some way we can fight back and break him. Undead Emperor and the King still haven't tried their hands yet. Undead Emperor never dies, and the King has an incredible amount of power, or at least he did, last we saw him. If he had ten gene locks open, he might be able to win. Don't jump the gun just yet. I'm sure it will still take the king some time before he opens his tenth gene lock. You and I both know the king is vastly different than most spirits. He is delightfully unpredictable, and it would not surprise me if he already had opened his tenth gene lock. As they spoke, a new island appeared at the spirit base. The king spirits looked over to see who was coming, and it was the person they had just been discussing. Han Senator, of course, they wouldn't recognize him as such. The king spirits drove their island towards Han Sen and asked him, The king? Have you heard about the human? Han Sen took a moment before responding, thinking to himself, Well, duh. That's me, you numpties. Of course, he was far polited to them than that when he spoke. And wanting to have some fun, he smiled and told them, That is why I am here. I need to open my tenth gene lock as soon as possible, so I can kill him. The spirits were enthusiastic, hearing this. They immediately said, You can break Super Spank? I have skill negation. To fight and destroy the boy, all I need is my 10th gene lock to be open, Hansen said. How do you plan on opening it? You can't take too long, a king spirit asked. I need to fight to open it, and I need all sorts of spirit geno points, Hansen feigned. I have water element. I can give you those points so you can kill the human, one king spirit offered. Yeah, I do need some. It would be wonderful to receive some of those. Hansen was thrilled, for he had played them like a fiddle. This was exactly what he had come to do, and they had fallen for his bait, hook, line, and sinker. It was normally difficult to gather King Spirit Geno points, and he could only receive one point for each kill. Plus, the last time he had come here, King Spirits tended to avoid him. They didn't like his pompous attitude, and neither did they like the fact he'd always want to kill them. Now, they thought they needed him, so their tunes had changed. King spirits began to line up, one after each other. They were all dying to give him their Geno points so he could challenge Hans Senator, and the offerings weren't measly, either. They often gave more than just a handful. This was the ninth spirit base, so the king spirits around often possessed 900 Geno points. Maxing out the figure to 100 would not be too difficult for him. I have Thunder Geno points. I will give you as many as you need but please kill the human. Me too. The queue was a messy one, as spirits impatiently wished to provide the king all the geno points they could offer. I will take your earth geno points. There is no need for more fire, but I also need someone to help me practice in combat. As Hansen watched his king spirit geno point tally steadily increase, he was exuberantly happy. Every now and again, Hansen came to the spirit base to collect a few points where he could and practice combat. He had never been beaten, for he utterly annihilated all his challengers with the greatest of ease. It was for this particular reason the spirits believed the king would be the person to beat Han Sr. And before long, his king spirit geno points were maxing out, one after each other, element after element. Han Sin was now able to maximize his efficiency with wind, fire, thunder, and lightning. He wasn't as effective with them as he would be if he was a professional that trained with one element exclusively but he was nothing to laugh at. The reason Hansen wanted to collect and better his elemental powers so much, though, was because of his desire to hammer out new, complex hypergeno arts. And that was what was great about humanity. 
Constan was in a fine, cheery mood, but the spirits around weren't. They had no idea Hansen was the king, and the king was Hans Sr. He initially feared encountering Sky King or the Lady with Serpent Throne, but fortunately for him, they did not show up. If they did, he believed they could expose him. They had seen Hansen don the appearance of the king when he activated Super King Spirit Mode. That being said, they had ten gene locks open. And once Hansen's Super King Spirit Mode opened its tenth gene lock, the chance of having an awkward encounter with them was far higher. As long as he kept away from them, and they could not see the king's appearance, Hansen wagered he'd be fine. Hansen hoped they had never even heard of the king, but that might have been unlikely. At the very least, he hoped they didn't like spending time in the spirit base. He didn't think many people would believe them, though. Even if they did try to expose the king as being Hans' senator, it was a stretch to believe, and it'd be his word against theirs. Plus, it wasn't as if they could challenge him. He had maxed out his geno points, too. Chapter 1334 God's Retribution's Goodbye Shortly after, Hansen had managed to claim over a million miles of land for humans. Unfortunately, there were hardly any humans in a position to handle the shelters and land, so he had to allow spirits to remain alive and serve as stewards for the time being. The spirits were right in this assumption. When they feared Hansen's takeover, they guessed he would need to keep the spirits alive to handle matters. And aside from saving humans, he couldn't actually take over and rule the third god sanctuary. It just wasn't feasible. Spirits gained power at a decent, steady rate. But humans had always been slow in the third god sanctuary, and although things were better now, they'd still take a long time to gain what was necessary to start ruling the lands Hansen had claimed. Hansen was currently resting in a shelter. He was asleep, but he was roused from his slumber by the detection of someone near. Someone not very familiar to him had entered his private garden. With Hansen's heightened senses, he knew that person had to be powerful if he had only now just been noticed. God's retribution? It was God's retribution, one of the thirteen members of Blood Legion. God's retribution seemed to be at ease, and he sat down gently, saying, Super Spank? Ha, huh, that's a good one. I got lucky. And besides, I didn't name it that, Hansen said unsure of the relationship that was supposed to exist between them. I've heard it's your goal to take over the third god's sanctuary, God's Retribution said, with a smile. Well, you've heard right, Hansen said. I wouldn't do that, if I were you, God's Retribution said. It's fortunate you're not me. But tell me, why? Hansen asked. God's Retribution looked over to the pool of water and told him, Blood Legion knew about Super Geno points and we've been killing super creatures since long before the existence of them became common knowledge. We didn't inform humanity about any of it. Do you know why that is? Hansen was not surprised they could gather super geno points with the strength they had. They were far stronger than average humans, after all, and it'd be baffling to hear them say they had never killed one before. Hansen was curious about what the man was looking to tell him, though. So, he played along and said, No. Why? God's retribution explained. Humans are actually the invaders of this place. By coming to the sanctuaries, humans broke the balance. Typical human behavior, really, like parasites. Although there is an abundance of resources, creatures, and spirits here, we slowly break the balance established in these realms. Before, when humans were unable to slay super creatures, things were already bad. After their slaying of those became common, we hit a slippery slope. The ecosystems of the sanctuaries are suffering. Hansen frowned and said, Creatures can nest and shoot out more babies, can't they? Do you know how many years it takes to produce an egg? And if you do, do you know how many eggs have been broken since your lie? Two centuries down the line we are currently treading, humans will be fighting each other for super geno points. God's retribution was genuinely concerned, and it appeared to grieve him to speak of these matters. After a lengthy pause and sigh, he went on to say, and a lot of that has to do with you. You're a remarkable person, I must tell you. But you're speeding up this process, a process that will only lead to ruin. If you continue doing what you're doing, this will happen faster than it did for the first God sanctuary. Blood Legion didn't tell anyone on purpose? To avoid this from happening? I'd consider that noble if it wasn't also selfish, Hansen said. God's retribution responded to the slight, explaining, we were delaying the inevitable. 
We knew it was only a matter of time before the existence of super creatures and life geno essences were found out, and we just wanted to make these ecosystems last. You've heard it before, surely, but humans really are horrible creatures. Their mistreatment in this sanctuary was a well-needed humbling. Everywhere else were parasites, invading one place until it sucked dry, before multiplying and bringing the same fate elsewhere. Take a look at the first god sanctuary and you'll see what I mean. What a sorry sight that place is in recent times. There must be something we can do to alleviate the issue, surely, Hansen said. God's retribution said, if humans insist on becoming part of the cycle, adjustments can be made. But like I said, we were delaying the inevitable and whether or not we can truly be a part of things in the sanctuaries and coexist with the current laws, I can't say for certain. He went on to reassert his meaning by again saying, humans have upset the balance of the sanctuaries. The first god's sanctuary is bad enough as it is, but you are making things worse. You said that already. But what if I decide to continue down the road I'm currently headed? What would you plan to do about that? Hansen asked, needling God's retribution to learn as much as he could about what he wanted. I won't stop you. The trail you blaze is your own, but with how people see you, you should set a better example. If your heirs are one day killing each other for a measly scrap of flesh, you can't roll in your grave and say we didn't warn you, God's retribution said, then turn to leave. Hansen thought he'd be threatened, and he readied himself for a fight. With his strength now, he was keen to stress the limits of how powerful Blood Legion members truly were. Hansen did not expect him to immediately say his piece and then leave. He thought the encounter had been rather strange, and his perception of Blood Legion had been altered somewhat. After it, he thought Blood Legion was an evil, slightly scary organization, but they were obviously concerned for the overall trajectory humanity was headed on. Blood Legion cared about the environment like the people of Greenpeace. And the thought of those two organizations sharing similar goals was something he was struggling to comprehend. Go to the fourth god sanctuary. I'll be waiting for you there. And when we do next meet, let's hope it won't be his enemies. God's retribution swiftly left after saying this. Hansen now understood these were his parting words, and the only chance they'd have to speak before his departure to the fourth god sanctuary. This was God's retribution's goodbye. Chapter 1335 Super King Spirit's 10th Gene Lock He must be making a mockery of me, Hansen ultimately thought to himself, following the strange encounter with God's retribution. He made it sound as if he was doing it for the children, but Hansen thought it was a ploy of some sort. He thought he had been lied to, and that there was an ulterior motive behind his words of concern. He thought he was being a hypocrite or a Pharisee, like a person that attends vegetarian rallies but still goes home and enjoys a good steak. He had been told that Blood Legion didn't want others to kill super creatures, as it would upset the balance. But Hansen knew they must have had to kill a lot of super creatures themselves to maintain the strength their members had achieved. What they were doing was pretty much what Hansen himself did, he thought. Hansen was never entirely truthful about how he went about things, but at the end of the day, much of what he did was for the betterment of mankind. He was still leaving things in good shape for others, who would one day carry the mantles he himself established. He was paving the way for others, whereas Blood Legion were only concerned with themselves. It was true, Hansen hadn't thought about the long term, negative effects and what things might be like for the next few generations, but it wasn't as if Blood Legion had the concerns of such eventualities at heart, either. Blood Legion was different, too. Their lineage and the strengthening of their next of kin was different than how ordinary born and bred humans were reproduced. Having an heir was a priority and chief concern for the members of Blood Legion. God's retribution had tried to disillusion Hans Sr. They make themselves sound so righteous, but deep down, they're as dastardly and wicked as can be, Hansen thought to himself. While God's retribution might have had his own interests at heart, some of the things he mentioned really would become legitimate concerns in the future. If Hansen did kill creatures at a rate quicker than they could reproduce, things really would be a struggle further down the line. The flesh of creatures was needed, and if there weren't any creatures left to eat, things would be dire. Hansen rubbed the temples of his head and thought, over the state of things. He still wanted his primary focus to rest on bringing the third god's sanctuary to its knees. He needed to save humanity and allow his mother and Ji Yin and to enter the third god's sanctuary without worry. But to do that, he had to ensure he could do so without killing too much of the local population. 
He couldn't mass murder creatures as he saw fit. If humans became the majority, that would be quite worrisome. It truly was like an invasion, now that Hansen thought about it. In the little time they had access to the sanctuaries, they had done a lot. Even Hansen was willing to admit humans were greedy, he himself included. Some were greedier than others, but it was an inherent trait of mankind that humans were greedy things that always wanted more. During the interstellar era, everything was a resource and every resource was wanted. And the spinning of resources always outpaced the influx of resources, too. With a desire for ownership of worthless items, silly hobbies and such, a lot of resources were wasted. The resources taken didn't all go to the long-term betterment of mankind. And it seemed ironic to think the more civilized humans became, the more waste would be produced. Civilization seemed to equal lavish expenditure that only came at the cost of the planets that were ravaged for the necessary components to feed and keep the flames stoked. Hansen thought man had become so in love with greed, they had forgotten themselves and found only appetites. Back in the Alliance, Hansen turned off his phone and had a meal with his mother. If Hansen turned it on, it'd undoubtedly be ringing 24-7. And the buzz of constant messages and notifications would shake the foundations of the building. When he defeated No God Emperor, all the factions wanted to cooperate with him. They all wanted to help Hansen manage the shelters he had procured. Of course, they cared more for themselves than they did for a genuine cooperative venture with Han Senator. They'd earn a lot for themselves by having joint ownership of a number of shelters. This also played a part in why Hansen chose not to return to the Alliance for quite a while. He knew he'd be hounded by fat cats and corporate jellyfish day and night. Also, they could line their own pockets with further unnecessary amounts of cash. Hansen was going to just let the G family handle the issue and save himself the trouble. G. Ruajin had even come to tell Hansen, you have to let some of them go. The G family did not want to take over the third god's sanctuary exclusively, as that would almost make them seem like a dictatorship. The sanctuary might then be viewed as a police state, forever under the watchful eyes of Big Brother Ruajin. They'd be hated. G. Ruajin wanted Hansen to give many of them up for distribution amongst a number of different companies and corporations, as well as families. He would lose a lot of potential money that way but he would earn a lot of friends in return. It looks like I really can't take over the third god sanctuary myself. It sounded like god Lair Luo might have been able to, but it seems he conquered even less than I have, Hansen thought to himself. Hansen didn't want to give up what he had earned, though, and he then said to himself, fine, if I can't claim ownership of more as Hansen, then I'll just have to take them over with a different name. After a while, Hansen stopped his ventures of expansion to focus on something else. He wanted to go off in search of Geno treasures that could increase his self-Geno points. He needed to open his Super King Spirit's 10th gene lock, after all. G. Ruajin, in the meantime, ran through his contacts, trying to determine the best partners he could cooperate with. A month later, Hansen had achieved a thousand self-Geno points and managed to open the 10th gene lock of Super King Spirit mode. It only increased the power of Super King Spirit Mode across the board, and there were no new, special traits earned. Super King Spirit Mode was very plain, but that was part of the attraction. It made you far stronger, and that was it. It was that simple. The greatest benefit of it now, though, was that he could remain in this form forever. There was no longer an annoying timer he had to adhere to. After opening his 10th gene lock, he decided to pay another visit to the Spirit Base. When Hansen entered, though, he was unable to find any other islands. Hansen chalked it up to there not being many spirits with 10 gene locks open, so as a result, there weren't going to be many to find there. Hansen drove his island around for a while and eventually saw another spirit. He didn't reveal himself, though. Only seeing one, he just turned around and left. After that, Hansen returned to the sanctuary and went back to conquering lands and claiming territories alongside the spirits and creatures in his employ. This news was relayed across the Alliance once more, making people even more hyped for the prospects of proper settlement in the Third God's Sanctuary. The spirits were all cooperating, and they no longer resisted. On the sly, though, they still pleaded for Undead Emperor to help them out and defeat Han Sr. Before Sky Mountain, Undead Emperor began leading a grand host of spirits and creatures to bring an end to Hansen's reign. Hansen, will you fight me? Undead Emperor asked, with a tone as chilling as a winner's grave. Of course I will. Hansen raced towards him, airborne. 
Chapter 1336 The Third Contract Between Humans and Spirits Undead Emperor was given a lot of information about Hansen by the other spirits, so his expectations had already been realistically set. The spirits called upon Undead Emperor to help slay Hansen due to his undying body, but just like always, the results shocked them. The previously thought to be indestructible body of Undead Emperor was utterly annihilated by Hansen's slap. Mankind had won that round, as well. And after Hansen claimed the mountain, humanity began to celebrate another job well done. But all of a sudden, a light shone in the sky high above. The ground began to shake, quake, and rumble. Tears formed across the region, through subterranean explosions. It was like a coming apocalypse, and it frightened the onlookers. Aside from where Hansen was, the land was churned into utter ruin and carnage. The mountains around collapsed into themselves sinking down into black pits. Eventually, only Sky Mountain remained, surrounded by abyssal depths. The humans that saw this felt a great chill. Where the encompassing regions went, they had no clue, but the only relief they could feel was the belief they had been spared somehow. There are words written across the black reaches that surround us, a person called out. When the people turned to take a look, they read it out. It said, We fight in three days. Yours sincerely, the king. Everyone looked at the chasm with worry. It was a sinister way to send a message, and even though they had full confidence in Hansen, they couldn't help but feel afraid. Hansen was their only lifeline. If he was defeated, things would go back to how they once were, as nobody else could carry his flame. The news that the king had challenged Hansen was all over the third god sanctuary. While this greatly excited the spirits, humans were less enthusiastic about the concept. If a human like Hansen was defeated, progress in the third god's sanctuary would revert back to zero. Mankind would lose their entire grip on what they had obtained there thus far, and would most likely be treated even worse. And with the spectacle that accompanied the invitation of entire lands being sunken, the fear of Hansen losing grew. They started to believe Hansen did not have what it took to defeat the king. The three days passed by quickly, and all that while, humans worried. But now, the day for that fateful fight had come. On the day of battle, Hansen ventured to the peak of Sky Mountain and stood proudly. He waited there for the king to show. Although humans were tinged with a bit more worry than the spirits, they were all excited to see and hear what the result would be. Eventually, a body that looked like the king arrived. And after that, the area turned black. Nobody could see or hear a thing. A second later, everything returned to how it was. When they looked up again, they were all shocked at what they saw. Hansen and the king were gone. Neither of them could be seen, and the mountaintop had vanished as well. The trail of a battle was found, though, one that extended all the way to the endless sea. Although no one had seen the battle unfold, the markings of what had occurred looked bad. It must have been a brutal tussle. When the wake of combat reached the endless sea, none dared traverse the place. The gravity issue was bad enough, but the tsunamis that raged were frightening. Seven days later, the rage of the endless sea was quelled. Although nothing of the fight could actually be seen, it was hailed as the most epic and legendary fight ever performed by a human. The Alliance decided to call it the final fight, but no one yet knew who won the battle. The Alliance said Hansen had won, but the spirits said the king had won. The battle had stopped, and Hansen and the king established a contract. There were three core pillars of the contract. It stated that humans who were sent to spirit shelters were allowed to return to the Alliance. Hansen would also provide spirits near absolute freedom, as long as they did not venture past Sky Mountain and left those lands alone. To the east of Sky Mountain was land solely belonging to mankind. Spirits were not allowed to go there. A lot of factions agreed with the contents of the contract, and it seemed like the best of both worlds. At the very least, it meant every Surpasso had been freed. Hansen had also secured a million miles square of land for humans to occupy and live freely in. The Alliance was worried that if Hansen died or had to leave the sanctuary, they would lose everything he had secured. As a result, they greatly agreed with the terms of the contract. The king became a hero to the spirits of the third god's sanctuary. When undead emperor was killed, all hope was lost. And yet, the king did not shy away from the battle. He went up and battled Hansen alone. And hearing humans were no longer allowed to go past Sky Mountain, they were delighted. Some people believed the king might have actually been the elusive dollar, but few agreed with that theory. 
Spirits did not believe the king was a human, and humans did not believe Dollar was a spirit. Hansen knew the contract had no power, though. When he ascended to the fourth god's sanctuary, it would be rendered nullified. He only hoped the terms could be respected going forward. So, Hansen used this opportunity to bring Ji Yin and, and his mother to the third god's sanctuary. His mother was sent to a place in the human lands, whereas Ji Yin and was sent to a shelter that belonged to the Dominion of Spirits. But because of the terms of the contract, Ji Yin and was allowed to return to the Alliance and let Hansen know where she was. Then, Hansen was able to go there and bring her to where it was safe. Hansen gave the pair a bunch of life geno essences to give them a head start. Hansen did not aid the other humans much, though. He wanted them to become strong by themselves, for that would be true strength they'd be earning. Hansen's subordinates became guards for shelters, but they wouldn't join any battles. Hansen brought a few of the people he knew back to the underground shelter, too, unbeknownst to some. Hansen let his mother handle many things there, while he took the time to focus on what was necessary for him, if he wished to reach the fourth god's sanctuary. Hansen also wondered over what Dragon King had told him, about the special gene lock that might or might not exist. He had opened the tenth gene lock on three of his abilities, but he didn't feel anything remotely close to what Dragon King had described to him. Hansen wished to figure it out before ascending, which aligned with the Alliance's desire of wanting him to remain for a while, too. When Hansen returned home, he received a letter. Much to his surprise, it had been written with an actual pen. Hansen opened the envelope, and soon after, he began to tremble. Chapter 1337 on the pill. Hansen recognized his father's handwriting due to the vast number of family documents and possessions he had collected and perused over the years. The letter he had received had been written and sent by his father. There was no room for doubt. It was easy to fake someone's handwriting, but the content contained information only he and his father would know about. And near the end of the letter, he read something that was most shocking. When Blind Man provided Hans and the cauldron, there was a pill inside. He claimed it was a gift from his father, and his consumption of it was of absolute importance. He was told to eat it before becoming a demigod due to its ability to aid him in unlocking something. This gene lock was not associated with the average 10 gene locks, and he had been told it'd be of great benefit for when he finally did become a demigod. Hansen had the sudden thought that this was connected with the mystic gene lock Dragon King had told him about. The letter concluded with a profound apology for his absence and how, as much as he wished he could, he could not come back. After finishing the letter, Hansen's mind was in a bit of a jumble. He believed it really had been written by his father, but it wasn't as if Hansen missed him dearly over the years. Traditionally, all the best cowboys had daddy issues, issues they'd need to confront and work on, but Hansen never felt a longing for his father. He had learned to become very independent, and he was used to being alone, and often enjoyed the solace that came with it. Even if the pill was given to him by his father, he wasn't going to just take it because his parent had returned from the grave to tell him so. He still wanted to look into it more, through his own means. But the letter also mentioned there was a way in which you could find out whether that lock had been opened yet or not. And finding out was not difficult. So, wanting to conduct the test, Hansen asked a few spirits to be of service in this endeavor. In the letter, it was said the nine life kept pendant had to be used as an apparatus of sorts for the test he was going to conduct. After a lengthy search, he was unable to find any spirits who had opened this lock. Hansen couldn't bring himself to perform the test on himself, either. So, he summoned Moment Queen and asked her to prick her own finger and draw a drop of her blood across the Nine Life Cat pendant. After the blood fell upon the cat's mouth, it seemed to then get absorbed. The pendant was solid, not unlike a gemstone, but somehow, it absorbed the blood as if it were a sponge. Then, a little later, the Nine Life Cat turned blue. The remnant of the blood it had soaked it had also turned blue. A little while later, the red blood that had turned blue, turned back to being red. This was just as the letter said would happen. If Moment Queen had opened that special lock, then the blood would have stayed red the entire time. But Hansen wasn't going to leave it like that. Tests had to be conducted a number of times before the results could be considered reliable. So, he went out and performed the same exercise with a variety of different creatures, spirits, and humans. It was very reliable and the same response was received each and every time. The blood would turn blue, and that was that. Even Queen's blood was like this. 
Hansen decided to try it himself. He pricked his finger and let a drop of blood descend onto the pendant. He expected it to turn blue, but much to his surprise, it seemed to remain red the entire time. Hansen was not sure what to think at first, but he eventually told himself, does this mean I have opened that lock? But when did I do that? Is there something wrong with this pendant? Did I do the test incorrectly? Hansen went out in search of others to reconduct the test. The results he received were the same as before, and Hansen's blood was the only blood that stayed red upon the pendant the entire time. Another lock, huh? Is it referring to the life door? Hansen recalled the feeling of unlocking something when he opened the life door. But ever since that day, he had not noticed anything different. He didn't think it had aided him, at all. If the Nine Life Cat was indeed performing correctly, though, there was no other possibility. So, I've opened that thing by accident. That's great. It means I don't even need to take that pill, Hansen paused, pleased with himself. Then, after a brief bob of his head, he continued on to think, if I give this to someone else, then, who should have it? Hansen wasn't sure if the pill was safe, so if it was something harmful, he didn't want it to bring grief to someone that was dear to him. But if it was something decent, he didn't want to give it to a random nobody, either. It was quite the conundrum. Hansen returned to the underground shelter and fetched the dusty cauldron. He called over Little Angel, Little Silver, and Thorn Queen. They sat at the table and wondered what Hansen was planning to do with them. Hansen placed the cauldron at the center of the table and slowly revealed the pill he had kept inside. Thorn Queen frowned, indicating she had no clue what it was. Little Angel looked at it but did not show any emotion. Perhaps she was uninterested, Hansen did not know. The silver fox looked ready to eat it, but someone else was faster. Bauer was on Hansen's shoulder at the time, and as soon as she saw it, she leaped down onto the table and gobbled it up. Hansen looked very nervous hoping nothing bad would befall his baby. But after Bauer ate it, nothing occurred. She shivered a little, but that was it. Hansen had tried the pendant test with Bauer earlier, but her blood had turned blue. A while later, he decided to take another pinch of her blood. This time, when the blood dripped onto the pendant, it stayed red. Chapter 1338 The Road to Becoming a Demigod Hansen stared at his nine-life cat for a while longer. It confirmed to him that the pill was genuine and that it would have helped him open the special gene lock. The nature of that lock, however, was a different question entirely. He paid extra attention to Bauer following this, but he did not notice any changes in her behavior or abilities. It was exactly the same thing that occurred to Hansen himself, following his opening of the life door. I'm glad you're okay, Hansen told her, with much relief. He hadn't wanted to endanger her. Hansen then spent most of his time practicing the Blood Pulse Sutra. He had settled on becoming a demigod once he opened its tenth gene lock. He wasn't worried about his absence in the third god sanctuary. He had done the best he could, with the ploy of crafting a contract signed by him and the king. He didn't think the spirits would violate the contract once he left. The territory he had established for humans was only one million miles squared, so it wasn't all that much, anyway. And besides, Hansen had a number of super creatures and emperors that would remain when he was gone. They'd help protect everything Hansen had done, and Queen and Qin Xian had become exemplary surpassers in the time that had passed since their coming to the Third God Sanctuary. One year later, he finally managed to crack open the last gene lock of the Blood Pulse Sutra. When the tenth gene lock opened, it made his body far tougher. It wasn't particularly brilliant in any individual capacity, but it was good to have it finished. He didn't mind it being underwhelming for himself as his desire for advancing the Blood Pulse Sutra had shifted in recent years. His focus with it, much like the members of Blood Legion, was to ensure his heirs would be stronger. It wasn't for himself, it was for the future generations of his lineage. And once that was done, he didn't have much else to do. He was going to become a demigod, but he was in no immediate rush to. He made sure to spend a lot more time with his mother and with Ji Yin and after this. The Fourth God Sanctuary, the world of demigods, was completely different than all else that had come before. Old Man Ji had told him it was just the beginning. Hansen had received the bulk of what he knew about the Fourth God Sanctuary from Old Man Ji himself. He wasn't going to underestimate the realm he would soon be stepping into. The Fourth God Sanctuary was still a world of creatures and spirits, but they started very much like humans did there. They started from scratch. The shelters there were all individual and separate from one another. Each shelter had a demigod Geno core, 
and to conquer a shelter, one had to claim the demigod Geno Core. After a human became a demigod, their own demigod Geno Core would increase in strength the more Geno points they collected. Unfortunately for humans, they now also had to play by the rules spirits did. If spirits sought to invade a shelter a human possessed, they could claim the human's demigod Geno Core as humans did their spirit stones in previous shelters. Demigod Geno Cores generated different types of powers. Old Man G informed Hansen he'd be stronger than the average starter demigod, but he also made sure to warn Hansen not to overestimate his abilities. He'd still be very vulnerable, stepping into that world. The demigod creatures that had Geno Cores would be lethal for humans to try to do battle with. The powers of a Geno Core were wild and unpredictable, as well. They came in all varieties, and if your attention lapsed, you could be killed by a Geno Core without even knowing how you died. Hansen listened to Old Man G intently, but ultimately, how he'd start off was down to luck. It'd be a roll of the dice. Most humans used evolution pools to ascend a sanctuary, and the same still held true for entering the fourth god sanctuary from the third god sanctuary. Becoming a demigod was easy for humans. But few humans could become a demigod the proper way, and going there without maxing out their geno points and making sure they were the best they could be would ensure a swift death. Even humans who maxed out their genes were susceptible to the fickle nature of fate. Unfortunately, luck still played a large role in their ascendance to the next sanctuary. Mankind discovered sanctuaries 200 years ago, but even after all that time, there were only 100 demigods. Like the Xi'an Min successor he once encountered, Hansen wanted to traverse the ten steps of the holy door. But his success there would also subject him to the picky throws of luck when he came out the other side and spawned. But as long as he didn't wind up spawning next to a strong creature or spirit, he figured he'd be okay. When he did leave for the fourth god sanctuary, though, he wasn't sure when he could return. As such, he made sure to spend as much time with Ji Yin and as possible. They went to a lot of places and experienced many new adventures together to forge lasting memories that would accompany Hansen after he made the jump. If he was unable to find a shelter, he would be unable to return at all. After another four months elapsed, though, he was ready. He prepared himself for walking up the fabled stairway. After a fond farewell to his friends and companions, with whom he had accomplished much, it was time for him to go. And when it was, he took off towards the endless sea mostly alone. The spirits weren't aware that Hansen was leaving so they were going to remain in order and adhere to the contract. With things still like that, he had now done everything he could for the humans of the third god sanctuary. Hansen brought the silver fox, Bower, Little Angel, and Golden Growler with him. While he was unsure at first, he also decided to bring Moment Queen. He would have liked to bring others with him, but they'd die if they could not withstand the searing flames of the steps. Hansen had decided to bring Moment Queen with him because he still had reservations regarding her goodwill towards humans. He still believed he had to keep the leash on her, to avoid her doing something evil once he was gone. The stronger Hansen was, the stronger the fire would be, too. His companions were sure to have a hard time following him up. He didn't even plan to bring Bower or the Silver Fox with him at first, either. But they suspected what he was going to do, and nothing he did would remove them from his company. Hansen thought if the Xian Min successor was able to bring a skeleton up with him, then he wouldn't have too much trouble bringing his super creature companions. Little Angel and Golden Growler were staples of Hansen's collection. They had always been with him, and he wasn't going to leave them behind now. They had ten gene locks open as well. Anyway, considering their abilities, even with sentimentality out of the picture, he really wanted to bring them with him. Hansen gave out the rest of his beast souls to his mother and Ji Yan Ran so they'd have a fair amount of decent gear and weaponry to get a head start in the third god sanctuary. He also tasked Xie Qin King and a few of the others with keeping an extra eye out for those two, to ensure nothing bad would befall them. With the underground shelter and the life geno essences they had been gifted, though, it didn't seem likely they could be bullied. Chapter 1339 Demigod Creature Blurk Hansen fell out onto the grass, coughing blood. Bauer was as cool as ever and when she came out, she did so with a graceful drop on top of Hansen's head, pushing his face into the bloodied soil. Hansen was immediately starting to regret bringing Bower, the Silver Fox, Little Angel, Golden Growler, and Moment Queen with him. He couldn't imagine what the pain was like for them, to brace and stay composed on their ascension through the fire. 
The fires Han Sen had to endure were of a greater intensity than what Xiang Yin and the Xian Min successor had dealt with. The lecherous flames they suffered were far weaker, and despite Han Sen once fearing the steps those two had trodden, he now thought they had gotten off easy. And that aside, Hansen had brought five people with him. This only boosted the intensity. He had felt as if the fires had been deliberately testing him in their wicked glow, like wretched demons taunting him to fail under the pressure of those he had selected to bring along. Fortunately for Hansen, he was able to employ the powers of Super King Spirit Mode, Jade Skin, and the Dongshin Sutra to pull through. He'd have most certainly failed had he tried to mount the steps without those abilities to boost his resistances. On their way up, he started by trying his best to keep everyone calm, composed, and alive in the ascent. But there was little he could do when the true strength of the fire kicked in. It soon became clear to him that the only one he could truly protect and guide up was Bauer, and the others would have to succeed by themselves. Hansen was able to keep Bauer shielded from most of the fire, but the flames had properly incinerated the silver fox. By the time he was through, he had become an egg. Little Angel and Golden Growler were in a similar position, now evolving. Hansen was unable to protect Moment Queen at all on the way up, and while she had managed to become a demigod, the fires had taken a toll on her. She was grievously injured, and it seemed as if there'd be little she could do for a long time to come. It's fortunate I did not decide to bring anyone else. If I had, the fires would have surely killed me, Hansen said to himself, feeling glad he had made it. Hansen took a look around. After that, he was in a field, one that was as plain as could be. A single wide expanse with no notable geography or landmarks to consider. He picked himself up and exerted much strength to do so. He was incredibly heavy, and it didn't feel natural. The very air seemed to tingle and hum with energy, and the atmosphere around almost felt tangible. Even the gravity felt remarkably higher there. It was lucky his body was as strong as it was, and so it didn't inhibit him. Unfortunately, his clothes had been entirely scorched away by the fires. He was nude in the field, and although it was a touch awkward, he was at least relieved there was no one else around to see him that way. Hansen, Super Body Super King Spirit, Ultimate, Level, Demigod, Lifespan, 500, Evolution Requirements, None, Geno Points, None, Demigod Geno Cores, None. Hansen did not know what the ultimate tag meant but he was pleased that his lifespan had another 100 added on top, bringing the number up to 500. Hansen already knew there would be no more evolution requirements before coming to the fourth god sanctuary. Even in the Alliance, there were no further evolution pools. It didn't seem to matter much where you went after this, even if your geno points were at the max. Hansen caught sight of some odd shrubbery nearby. The bushes had thick leaves, and not wanting to remain naked, he brought Bauer over to help him make some clothes. After crafting some makeshift clothing, he suddenly heard the chittering of an insect. It was a grasshopper, and it was making a squealing sound down in the grass. Hansen gave it a scan and noticed its life force to be obscenely weak. It didn't look like a demigod in the least. And although it initially gave the impression it was just a common insect, it kept on squealing, as if to taunt Hans Senator he decided he was going kill it with Ghost Slash and nab himself a few early Geno points. But before he could attack, he felt a pain come on to his right eye. Hansen moved his hands to cup the afflicted eye, but then, another sharp pain began to pierce his left one. Hansen swiftly started to look around and scan the surrounding vicinity for something else that might have been attacking him, but he could not see anything. The absence of danger he could visualize was strange, but his gut was most assuredly telling him something was wrong. The grasshopper then scrambled away, disappearing someplace in the grass. Hansen could no longer feel its presence, but I still felt as if they were in pain. So, Hansen used Dong Shin Aura to search. But strangely, he could not make out anything. Arg. An agonizing pain suddenly pierced Hansen's throat. But shortly after, it spread to his stomach. A cold sweat began to roll down his face, which was now twisting under the agony he was suffering. Hansen decided to use Jade Skin, which gave him that crystallized luster. Following its use, even all his organs were turned to shimmering crystal. Hansen could still feel the stabbing, but at least Jade's skin was enough to deny him the full experience of that pain. Hansen then sought to examine himself with the ten gene locks of the Dong Shin Sutra open. After examining himself, Hansen was able to notice the presence of something small and unnatural residing in his stomach. 
It was a gray silkworm of sorts. If he did not have Dong Shan Aura, he would have assuredly not been able to find it. The head of the silkworm was very much like a needle, and it was undoubtedly the source of the pain Hansen was experiencing. After more examination, Hansen discovered it was not a creature, though. Instead, it was the grasshopper's demigod Genocore. From this bug, Hansen was able to detect and learn the sequential structure of the grasshopper. The grasshopper came out of hiding once more, and it peered at Hansen through the blades of grass. Not wanting to risk a single thing, Hansen knew he'd have to kill it the first opportunity he had. He immediately cast Ghost Slash towards it. The grasshopper was cut in half. When it was, the bug inside Hansen's stomach died with it. Ordinary creature soil lotus killed. No beast soul gained. Bronze Geno Core received. Dust Bug. Consume its flesh to gain 0 to 10 ordinary Geno points randomly. Chapter 1340. Sheep. Hansen placed the dust bug on his finger. The Geno Core was so small, he needed the Dong Shin Aura just to see it. Dust Bug. Earth Element Bronze Geno Core. Making effective use of this Geno Core would require a certain level of proficiency with the element of Earth. Bronze was the tier of this Geno Core. There were four ranks of Geno Cores in total bronze, silver, gold, and gemstone. People occasionally whispered the rumor of there being a Geno Core that superseded even the extremely rare and exotic gemstone quality Geno Core. The details of what it might have been were scant, but the rumors never died. And if the mystical cores did exist, it was believed no human had possession of one. Hansen had many earth element geno points, so he could use his Dongshin Sutra to make use of the dust buck. However, this was not Hansen's geno core. It belonged to a creature that had been slain, and now it was forever locked in its current state. There was no room for its power to grow. If Hansen had a geno core he could actually call his own, its strength and power would grow in accordance with his own body. Hansen tried controlling the bug, and he quickly understood how it had hurt him earlier. The dust bug was so small, it had undoubtedly slid beneath the notice of almost everyone. It could easily cut its way through the body of a creature or person without drawing attention to itself. Hansen was also starting to understand why Old Man G had told him not to underestimate a single creature he'd encounter. The grasshopper was only an ordinary class creature, and yet it had dished out that much damage. What's more, it had made its own life force appear even less than it was. He knew he'd have to be careful, and danger could find him at any moment. With things being this way, he understood why the survival rate for humans in the fourth god sanctuary was so low. It was no wonder that only a hundred humans were currently surviving in the fourth god sanctuary and making a living which would allow them to go to and fro from the alliance. Most people who made it to the fourth god sanctuary didn't seem to live long enough to make it home. There was always the possibility that there were many humans living in the fourth god sanctuary who were just unable to find a way to return home. But even so, it seemed impossible for there to be many in such circumstances. Attempting to return to the alliance from the fourth god sanctuary required the same thing as in previous sanctuaries. They would have to either conquer a shelter or find one that was uninhabited. Of course, doing that was far more difficult in this realm than it now was in the others. There was a sickeningly low number of shelters that were owned by humans in the fourth god sanctuary. Their numbers were few, and the chance of finding them was extremely small. Hansen wasn't concerned with securing passage home just yet, though. He scanned the surrounding vicinity and told himself to collect 100 ordinary geno points, first and foremost. He wanted to get a geno core he could call his own. He had learned from his discussions with Old Man G that if he managed to collect 100 geno points, his body and power would generate one for him. So, aside from the increase in strength, there was a tangible bonus that now prompted his urge to hurry in the collection of 100 ordinary Geno points. He also wanted to do things in the proper established order. Hansen didn't want to skip around and try to take shortcuts like the ones that had benefited him greatly in his early days in the Third God Sanctuary. It was too risky to do that in this place. So all he wanted to do now was knuckle down and knock out as many ordinary creatures as he could find, one by one. It was not unheard of for many supremely talented creatures and spirits to receive a Geno core right off the bat, following their traversal of the ten steps of the Holy Door. Hansen had hoped he'd be considered talented enough to receive one, but he was mildly irked when he emerged in the fourth god's sanctuary with empty hands and just a face full of dirt. 
but at least he had managed to slay the soil lotus and earn himself the dust bug fairly quickly. He didn't bring the cruel bottle, just in case it was destroyed in his ascendance. Either that or it had become the cruel sand. Hansen looked at the body of the soil lotus and licked his lips. A grasshopper wasn't the most appetizing creature, but it was his first kill in the fourth god sanctuary. He made a fire, cooked it, and ate it. It didn't taste too bad. Soil lotus has been consumed. Ordinary gene plus one. Hansen heard the announcement play a number of times. He tried sharing some with Bauer, but she didn't want it. Hansen ate the entire thing himself and walked away with eight ordinary Geno points. Not too shabby for his first meal. Ordinary Geno points seemed to have a much greater effect in the realm of demigods, it seemed. Already, he felt himself becoming much stronger. I need to find a safe place I can hunker down in. Out here, in plain sight, it's too dangerous for me. Then Hansen took off in a direction, hoping to find some place he could use as a den. For the duration of his travel, he tirelessly scanned the environment all around him. He didn't want to risk another chance encounter with a grasshopper like the last, or even worse. And for a long time, he didn't see anything. Whether that was luck or the field was just a quiet place in general, he did not know. But when he ascended a hill and got to the top for a clearer view, there still wasn't much he could see. Plain, verdant expanses, as far as his eyes could see. He could have flown to go at a faster pace, but Hansen didn't fancy doing that. It was too risky and there was a high chance he could be spotted. Until he was familiar with the region, stealth would be his main mode of travel. After an intense, continued scan, though, Hansen finally caught sight of something. It was approaching. He threw himself into the grass to hide, and then he focused his vision on what he had seen. At first, he felt relief. It was a sheep, one that was as fluffy and as cute as the most darling sketch could bring alive. It had two black, twirling horns, and it was a plump little thing. It looked adorable, actually. And it looked docile, too. It didn't appear to be aggressive. Of course, having learned his lesson, Hansen wasn't willing to underestimate the creature. Its cute appearance could merely be a mask of deceit. Hey you, what are you doing down in the grass? The mouth of the sheep moved, and it seemed to actually speak. Hansen looked around him, thinking it had been a coincidence. He thought maybe someone had approached and was talking to him, but he could see no one. The sheep really did seem to be talking. What are you looking at, bub? I'm talking to you. The sheep's eyes rolled, indicating it was annoyed by Hansen's lack of response. I was just, um, resting. Hansen sputtered as he dragged himself back onto his feet, patting away the soil and blades of grass that still clung to him. The sheep seemed to smirk, and then it said, What are you? Actually, you know what? I don't care. Just tell me the powers you possess. If I think you'd make a valuable asset to my herd, you can come and graze with us, bub. Hansen's face twitched in shock, unsure if this was some strange dream he was experiencing or not. People had told him that the creatures in the fourth god's sanctuary were crazy, but he didn't think they would be this flavor of crazy.